Let's use Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics to describe the pendulum. But first, let's do a quick recap of the simple harmonic oscillator with Lagrangian mechanics. Over here, I've drawn a diagram of a mass on a spring. And this spring is attached to an immovable wall. All of the physical characteristics of the spring can be quantified with this constant k, and the mass is denoted by lowercase m. This coordinate x is measured away from the equilibrium position. So this spring is going to have an equilibrium position. We can compress the spring, and we can extend the spring. And that's going to be movement away from that equilibrium. And there's going to be a restoring force towards the equilibrium. So that restoring force is given by Hooke's law. So f is equal to minus kx. That's where this parameter k comes in. So k is determined by the physical properties of that spring. And we have a minus sign in Hooke's law because this is a restoring force. It counters that movement away from the equilibrium. So if x is positive, then we're going to have a force in the negative direction, and vice versa. So let's write down the Lagrangian of this physical system over here. One important thing to remember is that this is a one-dimensional system. We're not considering any gravitational force. The only force we're considering is the force from this spring. So let's write it down. Fancy L is the Lagrangian, and it depends on x and x dot. What is x dot? That is the velocity. This is Newton's dot notation, or the time derivative. And we're taking the time derivative of the position coordinate, and that's giving us velocity. So these are two independent uh, variables that the Lagrangian depends upon. So let's write the Lagrangian. It has the form of kinetic energy minus potential energy. The kinetic energy is 1 half the mass times x dot squared. And then we have to subtract the potential energy, which is 1 half of k times x squared. So we have x dot squared, and then we have x squared. This is the kinetic energy, and this is the potential energy. Now we can write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. So the Euler-Lagrange equation has a time derivative of the following quantity. The partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot, that's the velocity, and we want to set this equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x. So over here we're differentiating with respect to x dot, and here we're differentiating with respect to x. And both of these guys are partial derivatives, and this is a total derivative, and it's a time derivative. So what is this quantity in the brackets? It is the canonically conjugate variable. And because we have x over here, the canonically conjugate variable is actually going to be momentum. We have position and momentum. And that's very important when we move over to Hamiltonian mechanics, because those are the preferred coordinates for Hamiltonian mechanics. So over here, we're just going to have the linear momentum. Right? If we differentiate this Lagrangian, we're going to get m times x dot. We just use the power rule for differentiation. This half cancels with this 2 in the exponent. So that's mx dot. And then when we take the time derivative, we're going to get mx double dot. That's mass times acceleration. And mass times acceleration is the force. So what are we going to get on this side of the equation? Well, we're going to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to this coordinate. And there's no coordinate appearing over here. We just have the velocity. Here, we need to differentiate this potential term. And we're going to have a minus sign. We're going to use the power rule. That's going to give us minus kx. So we have the force is minus kx. That is Hooke's law. So we've recovered Hooke's law from the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we can actually write an equation of motion. I'll write that over here. We can write that x double dot is equal to minus omega squared x. This is a second order ordinary differential equation. So this is two time derivatives acting on this x. That's why we have two dots. Over here we have one dot and one dot and one dot. That's the velocity. But now we have the second time derivative, so that's two dots with Newton's condensed notation. And this omega, well, that omega can be written in terms of k and m. So omega is equal to the square root of k over m. It's the ratio of these two parameters. So you can tune 
the mass and this physical parameter that describes the spring, and you can tune those guys so that you can find the omega that you want. And omega, that is the angular frequency of oscillation. This tells you how fast the oscillator is going backwards and for forwards. So that is what omega is over here. And why do we have this definition? Well, this comes from the Euler-Lagrange equation. Over here, we had mass times acceleration is minus kx. So if we just divide both sides by mass, then we have the ratio of k over m. But we want omega squared, so then we take the square root of k over m. Why is it omega squared? Well, it's because the solutions to this differential equation can be written in terms of sines and cosines. And when we apply the time derivative twice, we're going to use the chain rule, and that's going to pull out two factors of omega. So we're going to get omega squared. So that's why we want the squared, uh, square of omega over here, and that's why we want the square root of this ratio. So that is the simple harmonic oscillator with Lagrangian mechanics. And a lot of this procedure is going to be very similar when we move over to the pendulum. So let's have a look at the pendulum now. Over here we had an immovable wall. Now we have an immovable ceiling. And now we also have the effect of gravity. So over here, I haven't considered gravity at all. There is no gravitational force. But over here, I have a uniform gravitational field. Gravity is pointing downwards uh, regardless of where you are. So you can define a gravitational potential energy function. Over here, we had a Hookean potential, and that potential energy was stored in the spring. Now we're storing potential energy in the height of the object. Right? We're lifting that object up, and that is giving it more potential. So let's have a look at how we can describe this pendulum. This pendulum lives in the whiteboard. It lives in two-dimensional space. A real pendulum would live in three dimensions, but we're restricting this to only two dimensions. And we're also going to make some assumptions. We're going to assume that this string that holds the mass and attaches the mass to the ceiling, we're going to assume that that string is rigid and that it is massless. So in reality, it's just going to have negligible mass. But we're going to assume that the mass is zero. So the assumption is that all of the mass is concentrated in this bob over here. And this is a small bob, so we can uh, even make another assumption. We can make an approximation that the center of mass of that bob is where all of the mass of the system is located. So that Im important property of rigidity tells us that we are restricted. We have restricted motion. And that restricted motion is along a circle. So we have a circle over here. And that actually allows us to go from a two-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem because of that restriction. We have a constraint that links together coordinates. We could write this in terms of x and y, where x is the horizontal coordinate and y is the vertical coordinate. But because of that constraint, where this uh, has to move along a circular trajectory, we are allowed to drop one of those coordinates. And we can just have one coordinate because we can parameterize the circle with an angle theta. So that's what this angle is. It's a way of parameterizing the circle. So that is what happens in Lagrangian mechanics when you have constraints linking together coordinates. You can reduce the amount of degrees of freedom that you have to deal with. So the dimensionality of your problem reduces for all the constraints that you have. And if you wanted to explicitly write out this constraint, it would be x squared plus y squared equals l squared, where l is the length of the string. And that is the equation of the circle that this bulb has to remain on. So it is restricted, it is confined to that circular trajectory. And it's going to oscillate backwards and forwards. There is a very special position, and that is the equilibrium position. That is when this mass is down here. So that is analogous to the equilibrium position of this string, so, uh, of this spring over here. So this spring has an equilibrium position, and the pendulum also has an equilibrium position. So we're defining the coordinates to have a value of 0 at equilibrium. That is why theta is defined in this manner over here. So this is positive theta, and this is negative theta. So that definition allows us to put the equilibrium at theta equals 0. So let's write down the potential energy function. I'm very interested in the potential energy. And then we'll get to the kinetic energy, and that's going to allow us to write down the Lagrangian. So first, let's have a look at the potential energy. I'm going to call the potential energy capital V. And it depends on theta. So I can uh, only write it in terms of theta over here. So in reality, the potential energy is just determined by the height. And the height is that y-coordinate. 
But we're not interested in y and x. We're interested in this parameterized version. We're interested in the angle theta. So what we're going to have is the weight force, mg. We're going to have mass times the gravitational acceleration. And then what we're going to have is L, which is the length of the string. And we're going to multiply that by 1 minus cosine of theta. So where is this expression coming from? We need to set a 0 somewhere. We need to have some location that, is, uh, that corresponds to 0 potential energy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the equilibrium position to be equal to 0. That is an arbitrary choice. You are free to put 0 wherever you want it to be. You can define the coordinates to have 0 wherever you want it to be. But we want the most convenient choices. Another convenient choice would be to set the potential energy at, at 0 up here. But I'm going to put it at 0 down here. So this is 0 potential energy. That is when the pendulum is at its equilibrium position. So then we're just interested in the height above that 0. And that is this height over here. That is the length of, the, of, of this uh, string times 1 minus cosine of theta. So that is this guy over here. So this is the height. So we have mgh. That's the height of this mass above the 0 position. So that is the potential energy due to gravity. It's the gravitational potential energy. And mg, that's the magnitude of the weight force. And this is the displacement above that equilibrium position. So where did this come from? Well, we know that when we relax the pendulum and we put it in its equilibrium position, this distance is L. That is the length of the string. It's the distance to the center of mass of this little ball. Then what we can do is if we lift this pendulum up, we're going to break this up. We can take the projection along this vertical axis. And because theta is defined in this way, we're going to have to take cosine of that theta. So we have L cosine of theta over here. And because we know this is L, and we know this is L cosine theta, all we have to do is take the difference. And we can factor out an L. So we have L minus L cosine theta, and that is equivalent to this expression. We can also make an approximation. We can use the Taylor series of cosine of theta, and we can make this following approximation. So this is MGL. And then inside over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some terms. So the Taylor series expansion of cosine has 1, and then it has a quadratic term, and then a quartic term. And in general, it has all of the even powers of theta. But the first term is a 1. So that actually cancels with this one. So we have 1 minus 1, so we can get rid of that 1. And the next term is minus theta squared on 2. And because we have a minus sign over here, that's going to cancel. So we're going to get theta squared on 2. And then we're going to subtract off the quartic term, which is theta to the power of 4. And I'll write 4 factorial. So this 2 over here is actually 2 factorial. That's how the Taylor series expansion works. And I think that's enough terms. We could add higher order terms. But they're going to have theta to the power of 6 and theta to the power of 8. And those are very, very small quantities uh, and very small corrections. But the important thing to remember over here is that there is a leading term. And that leading term is quadratic. And then if we want further corrections, we have a look at this quartic term. And this minus sign, that just comes from the Taylor series expansion. In the Taylor ex series expansion, this term actually has a minus sign, and this term has a plus sign. But because we're subtracting, the signs get flipped. And that's also why this 1 disappears. So that is also a consequence of where we set the 0 to be. We could also have an additional constant, and that wouldn't change the, the problem. Right? We would just be setting the 0 at a different location. So we have the exact form of the potential energy function, and we also have an approximate form over here. So now let's write the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian, L, depends on theta and theta dot. So this is the angular velocity. And this is equal to the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is the moment of inertia, I, over 2 times theta dot squared minus the potential energy, which is mgl times 1 minus cosine theta. So that's what we have over here. And if you just look over here into this diagram, I've, I've made a little plot of what this potential energy function looks like. So we have mgl cosine theta in blue. So you can see that it, it, we've got 1 minus cosine theta. And that's what's shifted this uh, sinusoidal function. So 0 is defined over here. If we didn't have that 1, uh, then we would just shift it to a different location. So we can move this potential energy function wherever we want. That is, that is a freedom that we have 
when we're defining the potential energy, and when we're defining the Lagrangian as well. And this red curve over here, that's a parabola. And that is specifically the parabola that is described by this approximation. So if we ignore this higher order term, this quartic term, then we just have this parabolic equation. And that is described by this red function. And this blue function, that is the exact gravitational potential energy function. So that is v as a function of theta. You can see over here we have theta equal to 0. And then at these points, we have plus and minus pi. So these actually physically correspond to the pendulum being flipped all the way around. So in this diagram, uh, it wouldn't actually make sense because we have a ceiling over here. But if we got rid of that ceiling and we just fixed it at a point, we could move this pendulum all the way up to the top. And that would actually be an unstable equilibrium position. You could balance the pendulum like that. If this string over here was rigid, you could actually balance it. But it is a very unstable point. The moment you perturb that system, it's going to go down back towards a minimum. So these guys are maxima in the potential energy function, and this is a minimum. And this minimum is a stable equilibrium point. It is a very stable point. So if you perturb that, it's just going to oscillate backwards and forwards. Unless you really perturb that, and then it's going to fly off and go towards uh, the other parts of the sinusoidal function. So we have the Lagrangian. One thing that I want to find from the Lagrangian is the canonically conjugate variable. So I'll write that underneath over here. So I'm going to write that as p sub theta. So it's not the linear momentum. It's not mx dot like we had up here. It's going to be the canonically conjugate coordinate. So it's actually going to correspond to the angular momentum. And the angular momentum is usually denoted by capital L, but I've already got an L over here for the Lagrangian. So I'm just going to use this notation, p sub theta. And that is given by the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot. So what is this equal to? Well, all we have to do is differentiate this. We use the power rule. And we get i times theta dot. And you can also write this as i omega, where omega is the angular velocity. But I'm already using omega to denote something else. So I will leave this as theta dot. So this is the canonically conjugate coordinate. I'm getting it by differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot. Now, let's use the Euler-Lagrange equation to find the equation of motion for the pendulum. So I'll write that underneath over here. We have the time derivative of this quantity, the partial derivative of the Lagrangian, with respect to theta dot. That is equal to the time derivative of this, which is the moment of inertia times theta double dot. So we've differentiated twice. We've used the power rule to differentiate with respect to theta dot. That's given us this. And then we've taken the time derivative. And the moment of inertia doesn't depend on time. It's a constant. And then we've just introduced another time derivative to this theta. So this is equivalent to the acceleration. It's kind of like the angular acceleration. But it, is not the, it doesn't have the same units as this quantity over here, as this acceleration. These guys all have units of length. right? x has units of length. This has units of velocity and acceleration. These guys have slightly different units. And the moment of inertia does not have the same units as mass. So this moment of inertia is playing the role of mass in these equations, but it is not equal to the mass. So let's write out the rest of the euler lagrange equation. This is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta. And if we differentiate this with respect to theta, we're going to have a lot of minus signs. So this term over here, this 1, that is just a constant. There's no theta appearing there. But we do have a minus and a minus. Now, those two minuses are going to cancel if we expand this out. But then when we differentiate this cosine, we're going to get minus sine theta. So in the end, we're going to get minus mgl sine theta. So that's what we get when we differentiate. So there's actually three minus signs appearing here. We have one minus sign that comes from subtracting the potential energy function. We have this minus sign, which comes from the definition of this height. And then we have another minus sign, which comes from differentiating cosine to get minus sine. So two of those minus signs cancel, and we only just have one minus sign left. So that's minus mgl sine theta. Now, the moment of inertia is known for this system. It is the mass times the length squared. That is the moment of inertia when you have a mass on a string. So let's write that moment of inertia out. So we're going to have m, 
L squared, that's the moment of inertia, times theta double dot, and that's equal to minus M G L sine theta. So that is the equation of motion that we got from the Euler-Lagrange equation. But there are some simplifications that can be made. We can cancel the M, we can divide both sides by L squared as well, and that's going to give us the following equation. We're going to have theta double dot is equal to minus G on L sine theta. And this is the equation of motion. This is analogous to what we had up here. So this is the equation of motion that describes the coordinate theta. And it is also a second order differential equation. We have a second time derivative appearing on the left hand side. But it is very nonlinear. We have a nonlinear term over here, sine of theta. We can make an approximation. For very small angles, sine theta is equal to theta. So I can define this, or use an approximation over here. So this is approximately equal to minus omega squared times theta. So this omega is not the same omega as we have up there. This omega is slightly different. We can define omega, so omega is the angular frequency of oscillation. That is equal to 2 pi over the time period. And by this relationship over here, from this approximation, uh, we also have that it's equal to the square root of g over l. That's what we have. So g over l is over here, and we're defining that to be omega squared, so we just have to take the square root. So then we can actually write the time period of oscillation. And the time period of oscillation is going to be, we have to move the 2 pi to the other side, 2 pi, and then we take the reciprocal. That's going to give us the square root of L over G. And I'll write that G a little bit better. So this is what we have. We have the time period of oscillation. But all of this is approximate. This is only for small values of theta. It's only for very small angles. So this is the exact differential equation for the pendulum. That is exactly what's going on. We have this sine theta term. But this approximation is only valid if sine theta is much smaller than pi or minus pi. That's if we're very close to this equilibrium point. If we're oscillating very close to the equilibrium, then it behaves like a simple harmonic oscillator. So that is the time period for a pendulum if the angle is very small. If the angle gets larger, then this is not quite the exact result. We have to add higher order terms uh, that depend on the angle theta. So there are corrections that can be added to both of these expressions over here. So now let's find the Hamiltonian. Let's take the Legendre transform and find the Hamiltonian. But let me first write this little approximation over here. So this is only valid when theta is much less than pi. And it's actually the absolute value of theta because theta can also be negative. So that's only valid when this condition is satisfied. And this is an approximation. All of these guys are approximations. Now let's go back to the exact form. And let's take the Legendre transform of that Lagrangian. And that's going to give the Hamiltonian. And I'm going to write the Hamiltonian in terms of theta and the canonically conjugate variable, which is p sub theta. So this is equal to p sub theta squared over 2 times the moment of inertia, and I'll write it out in full. We have m l squared. That's just the same as capital I, the moment of inertia. And then we want to add the potential energy. So if we add the potential energy, we have m g l times 1 minus cosine of theta. And then we can, we can actually apply Hamilton's equations. So Hamilton's equations are going to tell us that theta dot is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to this canonically conjugate momentum coordinate. We have p over here. And if we differentiate, well, then we're going to get the power rule, which cancels this 2. So we have p theta over m l squared. And this is encoding the same information that we have encoded over here. This i is the same as m l squared. So all we have to do is move this constant to the other side, and we have the exact same equation. So that's the, the same information encoded in Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. So we have how theta changes, we have theta dot, but now let's have a look at how this momentum changes. How does p change? So I'll write p sub theta dot, that is equal to minus, there's a minus sign here, this is not quite symmetric, minus the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian 
with respect to theta. And what is that equal to? Well, this is a constant term, so that's not going to contribute anything. This has theta in it, so this is the only place where theta appears. So we want to differentiate this. If we differentiate this cosine, we're going to get minus sine. But now again, we have three minus signs. We have a minus sign over here. We have an additional minus sign from Hamilton's equation. And then we have a third minus sign when we differentiate cosine, and that's going to give us minus sine. So we're just going to be left with one minus sign. There's minus m g l sine theta. So I want you to be comfortable with what's happening with all those minus signs. There's one minus sign in the Hamiltonian. There's another minus sign in Hamilton's equation for this time derivative of momentum. And then when we differentiate this cosine, we get minus sine. So again, we have a triple minus sine combination, and two of those cancel, which just leaves this. So this is the time evolution for theta and the time evolution by p sub theta. So those are canonically conjugate uh, variables. So this is the Hamiltonian formalism, and over here we have the Lagrangian formalism. The Euler-Lagrange equation in the Lagrangian formalism gives us a second order differential equation. And in Hamiltonian mechanics, this gets split up into two first order differential equations. So both of these guys are first order differential equations. Now we can move over to this diagram and we can unpack what it is telling us. This is called the phase portrait. Over here, we've got the angle theta. That's the coordinate that we're using to describe the pendulum. And over here, we have theta dot. I could also rescale this vertical axis, and instead of theta dot, I could write p sub theta. And in Hamiltonian mechanics, we would call that a phase space diagram. So that phase space diagram is two-dimensional. We just have a plane. And the reason we have a plane is because this is a one-dimensional system. So it only takes one coordinate and one momentum to describe the state of the system. All of these guys are trajectories in this phase space, or in this phase portrait. And this tells us the qualitative behavior of, uh, of all of the possible starting conditions. So to solve these differential equations, we need initial conditions. And those initial conditions can be specified by a point on this diagram. If you look very closely at this diagram, and you look at angles that are very small, so that satisfies this approximation over here. And these angles that are very close to that minimum, they correspond to closed orbits. So we have these closed orbits, and they are elliptical. And if you, if you set the axes right, you can actually get them to be circular orbits. That is what you'd expect for a simpler harmonic oscillator. So for small angles, we have the same qualitative behavior as a simple harmonic oscillator. But as those angles of uh, swinging back and forward, as those angles get larger and approach the size of pi and minus pi, then what we're actually going to see is elongations. And this is eventually going to get distorted, and it's no longer going to be an ellipse. It's not, it's not going to be a simple ellipse. It's going to have a slightly more complicated geometry. And eventually, we're going to get to these guys over here. And they are called separatrices. That's because they separate different types of qualitative behavior. And when we go up above these separatrices and we go outside these closed orbits, we have these wavy trajectories. And the wavy trajectories correspond to full revolution. That pendulum has, has been given a lot of initial momentum, and it is swinging all the way around. But it's not uniform circular motion, because we have a uniform gravitational field that is pulling that mass down. So that is why we have these slightly distorted wavy trajectories. And these trajectories actually are valid for any starting point. So anything that starts outside these separatrices is going to have this qualitative behavior. And anything that is enclosed inside of these separatrices is going to have a closed orbit. So let's have a look at three very important points. There are those equilibrium points. At the center over here, we have a stable equilibrium point. And this stable equilibrium point uh, is, is very stable because if you perturb it, it will return back to where it started. And it's just going to oscillate around. You have these closed orbits. But as soon as you go away and you go closer to these guys over here, you encounter something that is very unstable because you're dealing with maxima in the potential energy function. So these are called saddle points. This is a saddle point, and this is a saddle point. And what you can actually do is you can notice that this is a periodic uh, function. Cosine is a periodic function. So you can wrap this around. You can draw this on a cylinder. You can identify this point with this point. All of the points over here can be identified with all the points over here. There is a 2 pi periodic behavior. If you add 2 pi to the angle, 
you're back to a very similar uh, sort of graph. So this universe of this plane actually lives on a cylinder. So if you took this whiteboard and you wrapped it around to a cylindrical shape, you would get a repeating pattern. You can rotate it, rotate it around, and when you rotate two pi radians, you get back to exactly the same place. So this saddle point has the, exactly the same local behavior as this saddle point. We're always interested in local behavior around these equilibrium points. So the local behavior over here tells us that we have stability along this direction and instability along this direction. That is the definition of a saddle point. So along here, you're going to converge towards that point, and along here, you're going to move away. There's another term that I want to introduce, which is a heteroclinic orbit. This uh, this curve that goes from here to here, that is called a heteroclinic orbit. So it links together this saddle point with this saddle point. And what you can identify that corresponds to a pendulum starting off very, very close to that equilibrium uh, position up here, that unstable equilibrium, whipping all the way around and then coming back to very, very close where it started. And then it's going to swing back. So it's going to do this sort of trajectory. So that's very different behavior than what we notice for these small orbits. That is not a simple harmonic oscillator. So that kind of, for those angles that are close to the size of pi, that is not the qualitative behavior that we associate with a simple harmonic oscillator. And if we let that pendulum swing around and do full revolutions, then we're definitely not dealing with a simple harmonic oscillator. So these closed curves that, are, that correspond to small angles, only they can be approximated with this quadratic potential. So you've learned some terminology about this phase portrait over here. We have a stable equilibrium point, and we have this unstable equilibrium point over here and over here. And that actually is the same point because this is 2 pi periodic. And this saddle point, that's what it's called, this saddle point has some very interesting properties. And we'll go into a lot of those properties, and we'll see how that translates into quantum mechanics as well. So this phase portrait, this is a purely classical way of analyzing the system. But it also translates into quantum mechanics. There is a quantum mechanical version uh, of this diagram. So uh, what this video actually encompasses is both the simple harmonic oscillator and the pendulum, which are described with the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian framework. And that language of Lagrangians and Hamiltonians translates very neatly into quantum mechanics. For more videos like this, where we discuss all of these interesting mathematical and physics topics, make sure to check out the quantum mechanics playlist. You can find those videos if you click over here.